On November 17, 2020, at 7 p.m. EST, UTC-5, join Karen Olson and I for our workshop, Discerning Permaculture Niches for Your Livelihood. In this free 90-minute class, we'll help you expand your thinking about livelihood niches beyond the permaculture staples of design, teaching, applying permi knowledge as a grower, or building a personal homestead. Find out more and sign up today at thepermaculturepodcast.com slash niches or by the link in the show notes. I'm also running a pilot program on storytelling for design in December to share some of the processes I've used over the years to turn an idea into a narrative we can use to explain our vision to others. This is not an open class, but a limited program offered in the gift economy. If you would like to be added to the participant list, please contact me directly, show at thepermaculturepodcast.com. This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. During our lifetime, we will encounter a variety of short to long term disasters. The form the problem takes will vary depending on where we live and how widespread the incident is that occurs. In late 2019 and throughout 2020, we've all been finding ways to respond to the COVID 19 pandemic. More regular and localized, however, are man made and natural disasters. Though not a comprehensive list, arising from society, those problems may be a hazardous material spill, power disruption, nuclear radiation leak, chemical or biological threat, communication blackout, or civil unrest. While the natural cycles of the world, compounded by human decisions and climate change, include earthquakes, hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, extreme heat, winter storms, wildfires, and flooding. As permaculture practitioners, Understanding the nature of a given disaster, we can prepare and plan for these disruptions so that we can respond proactively based on emerging news or local conditions. From that information and our landscape and life designs, we can provide comfort for ourselves and mutual aid within our community. In my own life, living in a rural location for more than a decade, I would often spend two or three weeks spread across the year, cut off from the world and supplies due to flooding or severe winter snowstorms. But those problems arose from living in a wet, temperate area prone to flash floods, the impact of hurricanes, and long, cold winters. Something I'm not familiar with that many people around the world face are wildfires. Whether from lightning strikes, volcanic eruptions, arson, or gender reveal parties, wildfires threaten tens of millions of acres of land and hundreds of millions of people worldwide each year. So today I'm joined by Matt Fiddler, one of the producers behind California Burning, a five-part national public radio series examining wildfires in California. Matt joins me today to share what he learned through his interviews with land managers, architects, and others to understand the ecological role of fire, how misguided land management practices make the problem worse, and the way climate change will continue to create drier, more fire-prone areas across the globe. He then shares solutions we can take to mitigate these problems through personal action, better neighborhood and building design, and advocacy for improved resource regulations. Enjoy this conversation with Matt, and I'll join you again after. As we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm a radio and a podcast person, you know, similar to yourself, and a musician and that kind of stuff. Although I was always, you know, I'm, I'm on the West Coast, I live in California, and I feel like especially in Northern California, but really Californians all over, we really appreciate the natural beauty and and features that we have out in California, the great big mountains and the beaches and the deserts and the savannas and and all that stuff. I I grew up going to Lake Tahoe all the time, camping in Muir Woods and Mount Lassen and, you know, all these places. And so I, I always had a really great appreciation for nature, although I was kind of a city kid. So... I guess when I started working in public radio, I started kind of working on a lot more environmental things and uh, just learning more about this stuff that wasn't really taught to me in school. You know, I, I felt like I was kind of taught by school and my my family that nature was this wonderful thing and it was, you know, really important. But the best way we could deal with nature is just leave it alone. You know, it was a very much of a John Muir kind of attitude of like this is nature it should be preserved it's great it does best without us and i really believed that until just a couple of years ago 
when after spending time living in San Francisco, LA, and New York City, I moved back to where I am now, uh, to a town called Chico, California, which was my college town. And it's pretty rural. I mean, Chico has around 80, 90,000 people, but it's the biggest town in any direction for over 100 miles. And so most of the towns are just, you know, rural farming towns. And they were also on the edge of where the Sierra Nevada mountains meet the volcanic Cascade Mountains. And so about a year after I moved back to Chico, the campfire, California's most deadly fire, uh, erupts in our neighboring town of Paradise. And that really is what what really got me into fire ecology and said, oh my God, like I, I knew California had forest fires and that kind of stuff. And I knew, and you know, I lived in, I lived very close to Oakland during the 1991 Oakland fire that at the time was, I believe the most deadly fire or may, maybe the 1906 earthquake fire in San Francisco was more deadly. But anyway, uh, I had experienced fires, but the campfire was like nothing I'd ever heard of or experienced. And Already, we were having a bad fire season that year in, uh, in in 2018, and so I was starting to look into to wildfires and why they seem to be getting so much worse. And I was even, you know, talking to my local public radio station, North State Public Radio, um, about doing a collaboration on a fire project because I, I almost felt like I was sent home from New York to come to California to cover this stuff because as soon as I came into to California. There, there was smoke that summer of 2017. It was, you know, I, I, my wife and I, we sold almost everything we owned in New York City. We bought a, <laughs> a falling apart RV and we traveled across the country. It's kind of a bucket list thing to do. Yeah. And, you know, and after, you know, two months or something like that in the RV, we arrive in California and it's just smoky. And um, yeah. And so then a year later or a year and a half later, or so the campfire happens after we settle in Chico and it said, all right, I... This can't be just be a, a talking point between, oh, we need to log more or, oh, we need to log less. Because that seemed like that was the only thing part about the conversation that was actually focused on solutions. It was like, no, we need to log more. No, we need to log less. And I'm like, no, I don't think it's this black and white. And um, yeah, so that started me on my journey. Two of the reasons why I wanted to speak with you were that, you know, one, being here on the East Coast of the United States in the Mid-Atlantic we deal mostly with flooding and issues of water. Forest fires are really, really rare. And if they do happen, it's usually from a lightning strike or something like that. And they burn acreage in the hundreds to maybe a few thousand acres, nothing like what we see in California and the Pacific Northwest. And also because of your role in investigating this as a layperson, which is where many permaculture practitioners might be coming from when they take up an interest in this. We're not you know, necessarily ecologists or people who are, are doing large area land management and having to think about fires on this kind of scale. But very often we are likely to be someone who's living in a town that could be threatened by fire. And so I was wondering if you might speak to some of the things that you've learned in this exploration over the last couple of years of like the impacts that wildfires can have on us and also some of the ways that we might help to mitigate that through our individual or collective actions? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a, that's a big question. So one of the big things that I've learned, and this is kind of a, an overarching thing, and we can get into some more details of this, is that one of the big reasons why these fires are getting so bad, and I don't want, and, and not talking about specifics, because uh, just like how the East Coast is different from the West Coast in many drastic ways, like the East Coast, you get, you get rain throughout the summer on the East Coast, we don't. Like rain almost never happens between the months of May and October. Like we, ha I have not experienced rain. I think we might have gotten like 10 minutes of rain in like July, but that was then followed by a bunch of lightning storms that went off and set hundreds, if not thousands of fires in the mountains. So, um, yeah, so we, we do, we get fires out here from lightning strikes as well. And that's, that's kind of the natural time for them to happen here. It's not common for us to get huge electrical storms in the middle of the summer, but it's not, it's not never heard of. It, it happens. This is the big thing that I've learned about why these fires are so bad. Well, I mean, first, fires do occur here naturally. It is 
Fires are a really important part of the ecosystem in in the West Coast in general. It's an arid climate here. We don't get rain in the summers and we get a lot of rain in the winters and we have really steep geography. And so, you know, the mountains are extremely dramatic here. And so the wind, the systems, the weather systems come off of the Pacific usually and, you know, bypass, you know, a lot of the valley and, you know, it comes over the coastal mountains and then it goes into the valley and then it hits the Sierra Nevadas. And then that's where it really condenses because the Sierra Nevadas, you know, are eight, nine, 10,000 feet tall mountains. And so the weather hits there and you get big storms over the mountains. And then that creates really more dramatic geography as all the water, you know, travels down, um, you know, the various waterways and that kind of thing. And so trees grow really, really well because they have so much water in the winter and early spring, and then they get tons of sun. And so it's a perfect mixture for a lot of growth. And so the trees, you know, just they grow really fast here. The bushes, the weeds, everything just grows really, really fast here. And then at the end of the summer, basically there's, it's been dry for four or five months. And then maybe we get some lightning or of course there's a lot of humans here. And so uh, you get sparks flying from tractors, from earth movers, from cars. Uh, you get careless campers and careless hunters. On rare occasion, you get arsonists. And so fires will start in the West Coast and there's nothing that we can stop. Like there's there's no way we're going to stop fires from happening on the West Coast. Now, part of the problem why they're getting so big is that we've been actually really good at suppressing fires. So as soon as these start fires, we put them all out. Well, it turns out that the ecology of these of this area demands fire. Because, again, with all the growth of the trees and bushes and that kind of stuff, um, and then long dry summers, you know, trees drop branches and leaves and pine needles and stuff dies. And so that just becomes fire fuel and it becomes very, very dry. So then if we have a lightning strike, there's a bunch of built up fuel that should be burnt off you know, every five to 10 years by fires. But for the last 100 years, because we're very interested in, well, basically because European trained forest managers were, were trained in the wrong way because they were trained for European forests or even East Coast forests, which, right, get rain throughout the summer. And so we have these really dry forests at the end of the summer here. And then with 100 years of fire suppression, so these a lot of these areas, especially where there's neighborhoods and communities and small towns, they haven't seen fire in a long time. So there's this huge buildup of forest fuel. And so if fire does get in there, it burns extremely hot and it's impossible to stop. Now, and then if the fires happen towards the later of the summer where like the campfire happened in November, because of this really dramatic mountains we have and the changing of seasons, the, we get insanely fast winds. There's this area known as Jarbo Gap, which is between the Feather River Canyon, a major river system that cuts these really dramatic canyons, great river rafting. We have some of the world's best river rafting here because of these, these rivers. But it's also these dramatic mountains that create these canyons. And so the wind speeds up and the wind picks up, especially if there's fire, right? Because wind is caused by the differences in, in temperatures. So if there's non-burning land on one spot and there's burning land on another spot in a narrow canyon, that's going to create crazy winds, like 100 mile per hour winds. So then that will then push burning embers, burning pine cones. If there's houses in the way, burning house material, houses burn faster than trees because they're basically just dead trees. And so then that pushes the fire everywhere. Now let's add in the factor of climate change. So now we're getting less rain and we have even longer summers. Normally California, I mean, I grew up in California and from my experience, we would get rain usually by mid to late October. I remember often actually Halloween was often like one of the first rainy days growing up. I always can remember that. Well, we're not getting rain usually until November now, or at least not significant rain. And when you have these really big catastrophic fires, the only thing that really stops them is rain. Firefighters can slow things down. They can build fire lines to try to contain a fire and they can try to protect towns and they protect roadways so people can get in and out of town safely. But these really big fires, the one that's, that gets tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres, you can't put those fires out. It just really doesn't happen. The only thing that puts those fires out is the rainy season and the rainy season is coming later. So those are two big factors are kind of forest management, how we have suppressed fires 
and how we don't do other kind of maintenance in the lack of those fires to basically clean out the fire fuel and climate change. Those two factors are causing major disasters. And then to jump ahead a little bit, there's a third factor and that's neighborhood design. Houses in California traditionally were built out of pine trees, out of wood, because we have these huge pine forests here. And so it was cheap. It was material, you know, like during the gold rush, people just made these little shacks out of pine trees to, and they often weren't towns that were meant to last. And a lot of them were abandoned, but we kept up that tradition of building all of our houses out of stick construction here. And frankly, as I said earlier, that stuff burns. We're building, you know, houses made out of dead trees in the middle of forests that ecologically are meant to burn. And so we're causing disasters and we don't take uh, an effect, not just the building materials, but how fire travels. Fires are the most deadly when they're started at the bottom of a canyon because fire burns more intensely up, right? Heat goes up. And so if you're building a big neighborhood right above a canyon because you want that great view and you don't properly maintain that canyon below where everything grows, because right at the bottom of the canyon, that's where the river goes. That's where the water goes. So stuff grows really fast there. Now, that's the stuff that will burn really intensely so that if there's a fire that catches at the bottom of that canyon, it's going to burn right up that canyon and right into that neighborhood. And um, where we have hundreds, maybe thousands of neighborhoods in California like this. So while Paradise has burnt and parts of Ventura have burnt and parts of Santa Barbara have burnt and Santa Rosa has burnt twice now and Berry Creek and now all these towns in Oregon have burnt, this is just the beginning there are hundreds of towns, again, maybe thousands of towns that can burn like these towns if we're not careful. But there are ways around it. We, there are, you know, just like with permaculture, the problem can be the solution. And that's why I've gotten so into the aesthetics and the ideals uh, around permaculture, because we're running into a lot of self-made problems in our society, and we can't continue to do the same things and expect different results. Just sort of like we can't continue to use you know, uh, I don't know, what do you, what do you even want to call it? Industrial agriculture and expect to get higher quality food and our soil to get better. You know, you can't expect that. So it's the same thing with fire. We can't be building neighborhoods out of dead trees above uh, areas that want to burn and not expect more disasters like Paradise, Santa Rosa, Oakland. And this is where, in my background, I studied resource management. And as you were saying, like, you know, these Western trained foresters thinking about Eastern forests, a lot of our conversation was about, you know, logging. Do you selectively log for fire lines around towns? You know, are you doing clear cuts out to a certain distance around your communities in order to protect from wildfires? You know, we were talking near the end as the understanding of ecology came together about controlled burns, but it does feel like resource managers are still kind of playing catch up to this while trying to also manage the human desire to kind of live where we want to. Yeah, it's a it's a really difficult thing. And forest managers, not only, they, they want to do what's right for the land, but they also have to do what's economically feasible. You know, we live in a capitalist society and trees are still fairly valuable. But the problem is, is that Logging is not really the answer. It needs to be thinning because uh, loggers want the big trees. That's what's millable. That's what you're able to make valuable boards and lumber out of. But the big trees in the forest here are the fire resistant ones. Big trees don't burn. When they cut down old growth forests, they can look at the rings, you know, of a 500 year old tree and see that they've maybe survived five or even a, a dozen different wildfires throughout their lifetime of a really old tree. And they've survived and, and thrived. You know, they may grow a little bit less that season, but the next year they might grow a lot more because they have all this nutrients in the soil from the fire. Forest thinning demands getting rid of the small trees, the baby trees that are between the trees, the trees that are basically blocking other trees from getting healthier. And those aren't the logs that timber managers want. And so that's why this kind of agreement between the forest service and the logging companies isn't really getting what we want done. Like we'll give contracts to them. We like I'm the forest service. Well, I guess we kind of are. I pay my taxes. 
so there's contracts made between the forest service and logging companies and they say okay you need to do this much thinning and then we'll let you take this much harvestable harvestable material those tend to be really small contracts and they can't do enough and the idea is that unfortunately the forest service is super underfunded it's probably at its lowest level of funding per acre that it's ever been in the history of the forest service since it you know began and so we really should be hiring the forest service to do this because they're the ones that understand what the forest wants and they don't have an alter- they don't have a conflicting motive and, and it's not the timber i don't and i'm not trying to demonize the timber companies i use wood and i know they want like i, I went and toured around for the series california burning i i toured around with with uh, timber managers uh, on their land including sierra pacific industries which is the largest owner of land and uh, private owner of land in california and they want to do what's right, but they have to do what's what's legal, and they have to do what's right economically. And unfortunately, places like Home Depot and Lowe's doesn't pay. You know, they don't pay very much for wood, and so we're we've gotten accustomed to really cheap wood, and so short term clear cutting is the best way to make cheap wood available in the short term. But unfortunately, clear cutting, which can only be done in about twenty acre chunks in California. But that it, it kills the ecosystem in those 20 acres. And weeds grow back in their, in their place. When you ha- ha- cut every tree on a 20-acre chunk, the only thing that will grow back are weeds. A forest is a really advanced ecosystem. And I know you understand that because of you know, the, the aesthetics of permaculture, right? It's all about secession. And forests develop after a long series of secession, starting with weeds. And it goes to brush and shrubs and that kind of stuff. Then trees start coming in and, and then that develops the soil where it can hold these giant epic you know 100 foot 200 foot tall trees when you're clear cut you're basically starting over so the soil starts to die so the soil doesn't hold as much wood and so to replant those sections in order for the trees not to be out competed by weeds they actually have to use uh, an herbicide that's really similar to roundup on these 20 acre patches for the first year or two until the trees get big enough to out compete the weeds and so if you think about creating a productive ecosystem, clear cutting does the opposite. And productive ecosystems, as we know of people who study permaculture, are what mitigate climate and weather. You know, a productive ecosystem slows down fire because it has a wide vi- uh, a biodiversity of plants, of big trees, of small trees, of bushes, of, you know, so it holds a lot of moisture in the soil. And if the soil is moist, fire is not going to travel on it nearly as well. And then the opposite side of that uh, is the, this kind of misguided environmentalist side, which is what I believed in growing up in a city, <laughs> having nothing to know about forest management, but just, you know, caring about nature. I was kind of taught the wrong way that like leaving it alone is the best thing to do because, well, nature takes care of itself. And there's areas that we've been leaving alone and those areas are burning really badly too, because we kind of leave it alone, but we also still suppress the fires there. And so there's basically no maintenance of these forests, nothing getting rid of the dead, um, the dead branches and pine needles, nothing clear away the small trees. And so the big trees can thrive. An example of how this kind of works, if you've ever been to uh, Yosemite or Calaveras big trees or one of these areas that have the great big redwoods. The reason why these trees are so huge is that the Native Americans pres- did prescribed burning. Did, did they call them cultural burning? And that made it possible for those forests to have these huge trees because they didn't have other trees competing and it did a lot of things for the native americans it created meadowlands where you know deer and other animals other game animals would graze on so they could hunt there they brought back sprouts certain kinds of trees sprout after fires like oak and hazel and that was often material that they would use to make baskets in northern california the native americans uh were a heavy basket culture they used them for gathering food, they were tools, they carried their young in them. I mean, a Native American family could go through a a hundred baskets a year. And so they would do these small prescribed burns. So the next year they would get these um, virgin sprouts that were good basket material. And so all of this kind of added up to a well-maintained forest. And then of course, you know, with the colonizing of the West Coast and basically the genocide of the native people, all that tradition was lost, it was gone. And um, there's still some left here. There are, uh, I've actually talked to some Native Americans who are bringing back that practice on their, on their ancestral lands around here. And so thank God people are talking about this again. But basically we ignored how these ecosystems were taken care of. And um, 
yeah, it, it not only made our forests less fire resilient, but it contributed to climate change. You know, like climate change, right, is caused by too many greenhouses, greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere. Well, where were those greenhouse ga- gases before? Where was that carbon? Where was that, those uh, water molecules? They were in the ground. And, you know, it's a cycle. Water goes up in the atmosphere and it comes down as rain, then it goes into the soil, then it transpires through plants. And same thing with carbon. And that's something that I feel like we have a little bit more control of. I don't have control over a refinery in Texas or in Beijing. There's no way as a, as a peon, as a little person, as a regular Joe, I can't stop, you know, the bigwigs from burning carbon and putting it into the environment. But I do have a little bit of effect as, you know, uh, as an American, as, you know, a part owner in these forests to encourage good forest maintenance because a productive ecosystem sinks carbon, sinks water vapor, and that will help with climate change. And what you spoke to there reminds me of the work of M. Cat Anderson and her book, Tending the Wild, really revealed a lot of what the traditional land management practices were. And that was a big piece of trying to break kind of the stereotype of the majestic, untouched wilderness through my master's program. We talked at length about how our vision of what the world was like that came through the European stories of like the dark woods. We get like Hansel and Gretel and some of these other folk tales talk about how the wilderness was monolithic and, you know, at times dangerous. And then through the work of like Gifford Pinchot and John Muir and some of the others, seeing these amazing places and talking about them kind of as they were without accepting or explaining how they got there because we didn't quite have that knowledge of these forests that were managed and tended in different ways of the way that the wildlife that had been encouraged to grow there and the balance of predator and prey species provided a certain equilibrium while the land was also continually dynamically changing. Yeah, there's this whole... It's like a disbelief that humans can actually improve their ecological environment, right? Like, yeah, if you think about in Europe and, um, you know, think about Robin Hood and, you know, going into Sherwood Forest, you know, and it's like the leaders were all scared of it and stuff, but it was just the peons, just the regular people living in there. And so, yeah, the idea that there'd be like this hundreds of different nations of people, you know, the American uh, Indians that were actively improving the land and making the land work for them. Yeah, I I read Tending the Wild during, it it was, it was was a fascinating book. And, uh, and that led me to, to read Bill Mollison because it was just like, oh, wait a minute, this is how it can be done. Or this is how it was done. And this is how it still can be done. We don't need to go, you know, we don't need to go back to the past to treat land right and to treat it how we want it. We just need to learn the, you know, we just need to understand the lessons that have been learned that, no, we can, we can manipulate our environment for the good as well as the bad. Like we can, yeah, we can destroy ecosystems or we could build them. We can destroy soil or we could build soil. It's really up to us. And it's sort of like the same thing with building homes. Yeah, we can build homes out of dead pine trees in the middle of the forest or we could look to the past and look at this material called cob, which is this fascinating material that's been some of the oldest homes on earth are made of this material. It's basically clay from the the ground underneath you combined with sand and hay and you mix it up and you're basically making like a ceramic house that will withstand fire and is excellent insulation and the design possibilities are unlimited. We don't need to make a, a bunch of ranchers out in the, you know, in the middle of the forest. Uh, there, we have, we have other options. So like, let's look at, you know, let's use these permaculture aesthetic. Let's, what are the inputs given to us and what are the energies given to us? And let's use these correctly. Like, yeah, we're given all these pine trees. That's great. Should we build our home out of them though? Maybe not. That's, you know, not if we are surrounded by them, you know, maybe there's other things we can, build our homes out of, uh, you know, adobe is great. Like they use adobe all throughout the Southwest. Why don't we use adobe in California? It gets hot here too. I'm, I survived, I just survived a summer where we had probably had in July, August and September, we probably had 
Four days out of every week, we're over 100 degrees. And I live in a stick construction rancher house with no insulation in it. <laughs> and like, what a waste of energy. So I've just been blasting my air conditioner all summer. And if I had an earthen home with good insulation, and uh, I could probably use a lot less energy. And so yeah, I love the permaculture, you know, um, guiding principles. So they really, they really apply to these, the West Coast really well. <laughs> And this is where that intentional design that comes with permaculture enters into conversations like this, because it's that, you know, observe and interact. Well, what are the observations that we're making about these fires like you've laid out today? And it guides us towards solutions that are more than just what we can do our, in our own backyard, which is super important if we want to have permanent culture and create the resources that will last in the biosphere where we're at. But, you know, I think about all the hundreds of tribes that existed in North America before colonization and the different ways that the various biospheres were tended to within regions and the like biophilic approach we can take to where we live and to make better decisions about the way that we use these resources. Because it's like here on the East Coast, Cobb is gorgeous. But because of how wet it is, you know, it's a completely different design consideration compared to like the West Coast, because we have to have like longer eaves. It's often recommended that you protect it with some kind of a hard plaster on the outside. Well, what else can we look to here, you know, among Appalachia that we might use instead of cob? And then we look at things like stone or brick and the way that we can create these long-lasting, durable houses that also reduce our need for wood, you know, particularly in areas like where you are, where we have wildfires. I assume that there aren't a whole lot of brick houses in California, mainly because of earthquakes, and, you know, wood is more pliable. But yeah, exactly. It's just like bricks doesn't, maybe doesn't make sense. Although where I am, we don't really get earthquakes here. I'm in the middle of the valley. I'm pretty far from any major fault lines here. Bricks... And there are some brick buildings around here. Cause I, I live in a pretty old town. Chico is a, a very early town. And, you know, it's a, it's a town founded by a guy named John Bidwell, who was a you know a gold miner who struck it rich pretty early on. And yeah, and it, but then, right, these, just these things get started, you know, build cheap wood homes. We're just going to keep building them that way because we've kind of always done it that way. But we really should be looking at what makes more sense. For my podcast, California Burning, on the last episode, I visited this guy named Randall Hauser, who is a professional map maker, and he uses satellite imagery to, to map out where fires are, and not only where fires are, but where they're likely to be, based on how much fire fuel they have, how large the canopy is, how much biodiversity is in the forest, which way the winds are going. They're, they're really fascinating. And so this guy knows a lot about the fire-prone area that he's from. He lives in a little west of Redding, California, which is, you know, the other larger city. <laughs> I mean, larger city. It's like 80,000 people maybe in, uh, in far northern California. And it's where the car fire happened, which was one of the largest fires, not the most deadly, but one of the largest uh, fires of 2018. It happened right be before the campfire. And I believe it burned, you know, several hundred thousand acres, including his entire neighborhood. And now his neighborhood, everyone had somewhere between one and three acres. It's a very rural neighborhood of kind of hills and oak trees and, you know, low pines. Every house in his neighborhood burnt down to this foundation. Like it was just a crumbling foundation. His house wasn't touched. And the reason why is he understood which way the wind was coming from. There was a very shingled kind of house, woodsy, woodsy, as he describes it, neighborhood uh, directly to the west of him. And he knew the wind was going to blow from there. And so he does, when he designed his house, he had these wooden uh, or kind of curved walls. And so one of the ways that fire spread from home fires is they have these giant embers that are flying, usually from, uh, from shingles, from particle board, from that kind of thing, from even you know, flammable furniture. And, it, and he described it as like a crashing ocean wave and all those little, uh, like a, a crashing ocean wave on a bunch of rocks. And then all those little spheres of water, think about those as embers instead. And so you have all that and they push against a wall. Now, if they get stuck, that's when they catch a fire because it takes at least a few seconds, usually maybe even closer to a minute for one of these flaming embers to catch something else on fire. So he made all his walls smooth. Uh, they're not wood. They're adobe on the outside. 
he has all of his grasses and trees trimmed to a very short length surrounding his property. And instead of a shingle roof, he used, uh, used insulated panels. So they're metal panels that are two panels with air in between it. So that's the insulation. And he just washes them. Basically, there's no surfaces on his home where an ember can get stuck. And there's no vents because he has insulated panels that uh, the vents into the insulated panels point down. So there's no way for uh, an ember to fly into uh, an attic, which is often how houses start. Then he has, I believe, triple pane windows. Usually double pane is good enough, but for um, single pane windows, if you have a fire, even maybe 50 feet close to your house, if it's a really, really big fire and you have single panel, single pane windows, your furniture might catch, like spontaneously combust from the heat. Like uh, in uh, a lot of these home fires, houses are burning from the inside out. And so he basically did it. He had really good insulation. He had defensible space where nothing would burn directly around his house. And he had, yeah, just a design where it wouldn't burn. And of course, he probably spent a good amount of money. This was a custom house that he built himself because he's also an architect. But it shows you that you can build a house that will survive a fire. And there's been a lot of examples of this. um, If you have defensible space and you know how to design a house, you can you can make a house that's in the middle of the woods that won't burn, even if there's a catastrophic fire. Of course, he still did uh, evacuate when the fire came through. He didn't want to live, you know, live through that. But um, it's possible to do. And you know, he just he thought about the energies coming into his home and what the possibilities are and how to deflect those energies, and it worked. And even with all of those precautions in place, as you say, he still evacuated rather than, you know, take the risk of trying to stay in that location. Right, because he knew, well, a lot of people, the reason why they stay is to try to protect their home. And, you know, because you can protect your home, especially if you have a place to get away from the smoke. Uh, You know, because again, these, your homes are often caught on fire by like just a a small ember the size of a pine cone or or smaller even. And so if you see one, if you're at home and you have a garden hose out um, and you see one of those embers fly against your home, you can just spray it with a garden hose or literally pick it up and move it somewhere. And if you weren't there, that might have caught your home on fire. But Randall didn't need to do this because he knew his home was safe. I mean, of course, he still was worried, (laughs) you know, like he hadn't had a real serious test of his design until the car fire happened. So he was still nervous leaving it. You know, there's nothing going to change that. But he came back after he was given clearance to come back to the neighborhood. And his was the only house that survived. And from these individual actions that we can take when considering design and location, from what you shared today, it also sounds like we do have a role in the broader conversation about how to respond to the conditions that are creating these problems, not just the broader issue of climate change, but also in seeking out where we get our wood from, in advocating for policies that are holistic and based on broad top-down policies rather than necessarily like individual landowners creating plans as they move forward. Through your exploration of all of this, what were some of the things that emerged for things that we can do as citizens interested in broader change? Well, there's a couple of things. And so, I mean, yes, there there needs to be some top-down policies, not just the state of California, but Federal, the federal government actually manages more land, more wild space in California than the state does. And so there, there's a couple of things we need to, as citizens, we need to learn to expect more smoke during the non-fire season, because we need to be doing more prescribed burns. And I, I believe this is starting to change because we're, we're realizing that the lack of prescribed burns is a major thing. But one of the things that stops there's a lot of things that need to line up for prescribed burns. You need to have Cal Fire or other firefighters on board who are certified to oversee this. The conditions can't be too dry. They can't be windy because fire is hard to contain and windy. And then there's the Air Resources Board, which, you know, I, I love their Air Res- Resources Board because it's important to keep back factories from polluting too much and they, they have strong um, regulations on car exhaust. But I think for the most part, they should not be regulating fire because, uh, or prescribed burns. Cause if we don't 
prescribed burn an area that needs to be burned it's going to be it's eventually going to burn in a wildfire which will cause a lot more smoke these prescribed burns are very low intensity fires where it's just burning on the ground it's just burning the surface fuels it's not burning the trees it may they may singe the trunks of the trees but it's not getting up into the canopy of the trees so i think just education is really important because again as a kid you know i i was growing up with with a with a love of nature and a respect of nature Whenever I would see a prescribed burn or a pile burn done by a rancher, I go, oh my God, what are these people doing? They're polluting the air and I want to be out in the woods and now there's smoke here. We need to get used to that. You know, I was wrong. Like the, we needed a lot more burns. Traditionally, before, you know, colonization, California probably had somewhere in the range of one to four million acres burn every year. You know, we have about 33 million acres of forest. I could be wrong. But I, I think we have around 30-something million acres of forests in this, uh, in this state. And about somewhere between 1 and 4 million acres that burnt every year in California before colonization. And so, like, we had, a, you know, around 4 million acres burn in California this year. Now, of course, these were really severe burns. They should be 4 million acres or 1 million acres of light burns of little patches you want a mosaic of light burns across the forest not heavy burns because these heavy burns are doing damage to the forests but light burns you know they really help it so we just we need to get used to it the other thing is we need a very comprehensive well-funded forest maintenance program now forest maintenance where you're removing the forest litter and then probably following it up with burns most of the areas are not ready for prescribed fire because there's too much fuel on the ground. So there needs to be kind of individual mastication where they where they grind up that stuff and they they wood chip it and they do that kind of stuff and they remove that stuff from the forest first. And that costs, from what all the forest managers have told me, between $1,000 and $2,000 per acre to maintain that. So that's a lot of money. So if you think about, we have maybe 20 million acres that need to be maintained, and I'm going to take out my little calculator here. We have 20 million acres. That's 20,000. Now we times that by the high of $2,000 per acre. Wow, that's a big number. Uh, let's see. It's, that's $40 billion. So yeah, we need to, but how many, how many billions of dollars have we spent cleaning up after fires just to have dead forests behind. I think it was $2 billion to clean up paradise. And all we have is a dead forest uh, and a burnt out town and a bunch of pollution in our waterways. That, that's the one thing I also didn't talk about with fires when they get into towns. It is horrible for the environment, way worse than a regular forest fire, because think about all the harmful chemicals you have in your house from cleaners to your furniture, to computers, uh, to your car. All that stuff burns and then the rain comes and it puts it right into our waterways that, you know, we're using for farming and drinking water. So there's basically we need our ounce of prevention rather than our pound of cure because we're spending tons of money fighting fires. And, and something that I've been recently learning is that off the techniques used to fight fires out in the wilderness are often more harmful to the forest than the fires themselves. They're cutting down old growth because there's no regulation on what you do to put out a fire. You can do literally anything. You could cut out down old growth forests. You can dump dangerous chemicals, aka fire retardant, all over the ecosystems. You can draw mile wide lines that basically just draw down to mineral soil, which of course is destroying the ecosystem and destroying the soil. And so then after the fire's out, what do you have? You have like a forest that's been majorly screwed up. After a fire that's been not fought, you have a bunch of ash on the ground and you have a bunch of seeds. And I don't know, you can't have a blanket answer that fighting fires is worse for it than letting them burn because it, it, it's an individual basis. But there's an argument for letting fires burn because it's doing the work that needs to be done. But more importantly, we need a maintenance program so these fires don't burn as badly. And we do spend that money. We just spend it on forest fighting and we need to spend it on maintenance. And this for this uh, pyrogeographer that I've been talking to regularly ever since the campfire was, you know, told me that in an interview, he said, we need a comprehensive forest maintenance program if we're ever going to get ahead of this. Otherwise, we're just going to constantly fight fires and eventually we're not going to have any healthy forests left. They're just going to all be gone. Like 
Like what's happening in Brazil, of course, there's it's a very different situation. It's ranchers that are burning uh, rainforest for grazing land, but they're saying basically they're they're converting that ecosystem into a lower form of ecosystem. It's going from a rainforest into a savanna. And savanna is like what the ecosystem we have in Northern California on the valley, in the foothills. You know, we have oak trees and, and manzanita and that kind of stuff. But the forest is a little bit higher level of an ecosystem and has richer soil and a much larger biodiversity of, of plants and animals and that kind of stuff. And, and it gets more rain. And basically these fires that are happening at the 2,000, 3,000 elevation level are slowly converting that land from forest into something more like an oak savanna. The town right next to Paradise that basically let the fire come in it's a town called Concow, and Concow used to be a forested community, but it was clear-cut shortly after the gold rush, and it was never replanted, and there's been several fires coming in it, because once you have a mono crop of trees, fire spreads really fast, and especially because they're not rich ecosystems that have water in the ground. So Concow is burnt every 10 years or so for the last 50 years, and now nothing is coming back. There's, it's just grasses. You know, there's, there's still some dead stumps up. But Concow is basically just an area where fire can spread really rapidly through grasses. And that's how uh, Paradise burnt. The campfire actually started in this town called Polga, which is on the other side of Concow. And people in Paradise first heard about it and they're like, oh, well, that's pretty far away from us. That's, you know, 10 or 15 miles or something. But since Concow had never recovered and there'd never been any reforestation ever effort, the winds blew it really strong. Concow got singed again, and the fire went right up into the town of Paradise. So, yeah, maintenance. And in the long run, that maintenance would reduce the cost of likely fire insurance as those forest fires destroy less homes and reduce the overall risk to human habitation. We would be doing less to rebuild those communities. They could stay extant even though fires would burn, and likely the maintenance in the long run would be cheaper than these ongoing mitigation efforts when fires do come through, through the firefighting, and really, as you said in the beginning, pushing against these fires until the rains come. And yet we don't have the political will or policy at this point to make that happen. And so that's a place where we as individuals can help to advocate for that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We need, we need to advocate for long-term thinking. And, you know, an, another part of that problem is, right, is these, um, you know, neighborhood developers, um, they don't want these rules about this. They want to be able to, you know, California, you know, I mean, right, the, the population is growing. It continues to grow. California just hit 40 million people. And we need, you know, and, and now, and we have a bunch of houses that are burning. And so we need more houses. And so, right, we're, we're really good as a society about thinking about short-term answers. And so, yeah, we need cheap wood, cut down 20 acres of trees at a time. We need cheap housing, build cheap housing in the middle of the woods where the land is inexpensive. But yeah, it, it's not a good long-term solution. It's going to cost a lot more by, uh, yeah, not thinking about these things. And this becomes even worse as you also laid out the beginning as we look at climate change and these fires become larger and larger year after year unless we take some kind of action now to prevent this kind of long-term damage. Yeah, and and of course these fires are are the the fires are a snowballing effect of climate change, right? Cuz the fires are partially really bad because of climate change, right? Longer, drier season. Oh, and that that that's the other thing about climate change that really contributes to this. Um you may have heard about the bark beetle problem that's plaguing a lot of the West Coast really from Colorado, Montana, Washington, Oregon, California. It's these in, in infestations of, of a, a natural part of the ecosystem, which is the bark beetle. And basically they're there to, you know, eat up dead trees, you know, part of breaking down the trees to turn them into soil. Well, the problem is, is that the overnight lows during the winter are much warmer than they used to be. And bark beetles come out in the spring and they generally, they, they lay their eggs and they're basically in a hibernation period in their, you know, larva form or whatever, an egg form in the winter. And usually the freezes kill off a large chunk of those, of those bugs. 
Well, they're not because the overnight lows aren't cold enough to actually do that. And so the populations from the bark beetle are much larger than they'd normally be. And then you combine that with overgrown forests from a lack of fire and a lack of maintenance. And again, we've cut down most of the old growth forests, right? Old growth trees, like, you know, a 300 year old pine tree is going to be, you know, healthy pine tree is going to be really resistant to a bark beetle. A bark beetle is not going to be able to get through the sap and the outer bark, but a sick tree or a small tree easily can. And, you know, if that happened every once in a while, that's not a, that's not a horrible thing, right? Maybe that tree was a little bit weak genetically, but because of the huge populations of bark beetle and the large population of small and small trees and underfed trees, because there's lack of water, more trees fighting for less water, they're going to be a lot less healthy. Then it just, now you have tons of, you know, it's, again, this is kind of a permaculture problem, right? You have one, you have lack of biodiversity, you have lack of coherent weather problems, you're going to get pest infestations. And that's what's happened. And so then, of course, all those dead trees make it for much more flammable land. And then when everything burns, we're putting up tons of CO2. Like I can't even imagine what the equivalent of cars on the road, uh, the 4 million acres that have burned in California, the 4 million acres that have burned in Oregon. Like what's the equivalent of that? I mean, Oregon only has 2 million people, I think. So I doubt Oregon creates a whole lot of population, a whole lot of pollution from, you know, factories and cars because there's not a lot of people, but they just caused a bunch of CO2 from all the forest burning. And um, the fire season of 2018, which was the worst we'd ever had until this year, he said basically all the the climate change and uh, mitigation and carbon offsets that California has done for the last 10 years was wiped out in one year's worth of fire. And of course, this last year was even worse than that year. So yeah, it's a snowballing problem. Like climate change makes fires worse. Fires make climate change worse. So it's, um, yeah, a little depressing. So, so it's, and again, this is why I really started learning permaculture because, you know, I, I own a uh, one quarter acre of land in uh, my little kind of city blockish a uh, little plot of land here in, in Chico. And I'm learning how to try to make that land do what it wants to do best and trying to build soil. And if everyone who owned any piece of land just concentrated on building soil, you know, that could be a, that could be a big help, especially if you own a lot of land. And so that's what I'm trying to do and, and trying to spread the word about that we can do too. Cause I, I, I think farmers are wanting to do this as well. There's a university in my town called Ch it's California state university, Chico. There's a big agriculture department cause we're a, a very ag focused area and they're starting the first universe, or at least California state university regenerative ag program. And they're working with local uh, ranchers and uh, to improve their, their orchards and their, their rice fields and that kind of stuff to be uh, more regenerative. And so we can be doing things, you know, because even the, the farmland here, right? Like that's, that's one of the biggest opportunities to help with climate change that I feel like we're not focusing on is uh, if we turned every acre of farmland in, in the United States into kind of a permaculture farm or a regenerative, you know, farm where we're actually sinking carbon instead of sinking nitrogen-based fertilizers, we could do so much to uh, take carbon out of the atmosphere, you know, and, and still drive our gas guzzling SUV. SUV. <laughs> Not that I recommend that, but we wouldn't have to cut pollution like a ridiculous amount if we just increased the ability of our ecosystems to swallow up carbon. And it's, it's so frustrating that we're not doing that. You know, like that's something we could be doing now. Let's convert our farms. Let's, let's re-subsidize our, uh, our farm bill to stop subsidizing a bunch of fertilizers and giant earth-moving equipment and, you know, ways that we just create tons of wheat and soil and soy and things like that and actually make, you know, a bunch of food for us. It create a lot of, a lot of jobs, that's for sure. Creates a lot of, <laughs> it does have a lot of demand for labor. I know, I know that but you can sign me up. And before we draw this conversation to a close, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? I assume that most of your listeners already know this, but I'll say it again, and I think it's worth, worth saying. Humans are part of the ecosystem, and we must accept that. And all these problems we're dealing with, from COVID to wildfires to flooding to tornadoes to, you know, um, 
lack of self of sustainability for you know um, for the poor people in our country. All of this can be solved. I feel like uh, with the permaculture aesthetic of understanding our inputs of improving soil, and uh, we can help with all of these problems. They are all they all stem from this belief that we are separate from our ecosystem. But the truth is the 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 absolute truth is, and science backs this up 100%, is that humans could have never come into being without a really healthy, productive, sustainable ecosystem. That's the only reason why the high form of life that is known as Homo sapien exists, is that we had extremely productive, resilient ecosystems on this planet. And uh, right now, we're destroying those. And, you know, it may not be 100 years from now, but if we continue on this path... Humans won't be able to live on this planet anymore, you know? And uh, right now we have 7 billion of them. And the idea of 7 billion people, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. Like, come on, folks, let's get out there. Let's accept that we're part of the ecosystem and let's improve it. Thank you, Matt, for joining me today for this interview on the Permaculture Podcast. Scott, it was my absolute pleasure. And that was Matt Fiddler. Find out more about wildfires and what Matt learned through his podcast, California Burning, at californiaburning.net. For Patreon supporters, I've released a bonus episode with additional resources on wildfires, the ecology of fire, and land management. You can get that as well as weekly updates, a discount on consultations and meanderings, and join in the monthly Ask Me Anything thread at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. Also, through the end of the year, To anyone who donates $50 to the show, I'll send you a USB drive with the first 10 years of the show from October 2010 to October 2020. Donate today online at paypal.me slash permaculturepodcast or drop something in the mail. Scott Mann, 210 East Fairfax Street, number 300, Falls Church, Virginia, 22046. Finally, if there's any way I can help you on your journey, please get in touch with me. Email show at the permaculturepodcast.com. Until the next time, spend each day creating the world you want to live in by taking action to plan for and mitigate disasters while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.